And the second thing that drives me is uh, I really believe the path that's right for you is the one that causes the most spiritual growth, whatever that is. If that's you being an artist that causes the biggest spiritual growth in you, that's what you should be doing. Um, for me, that just happens to be entrepreneurship. Hi everyone, uh, Paul Viskuch, I'm uh, on the board for the Kiwi Leadership Network. Uh, uh, Xavier uh, told me his vision a few years ago, so I've been along for the ride. It's been a lot of fun meeting and staying connected with all these uh, leading innovative Kiwis, so it's been great. So I, I get the privilege of uh, moderating the uh, Kiwi uh, business panel. Uh, so if I could have uh, Divya come up. Um, where's Divya? Divya, uh, uh, sit here. There's, a, there's the method to the madness on the order. Um, uh, Divya was uh, Young New Zealander of the Year a few years Long ago. Long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she um, is currently product managed for Google, for Google Maps, something we all mm -hmm. use. So um, well done for that. And uh, uh, through the... Um, uh, through the uh, panel discussion, one thing I wanted to talk to Diva is that she's uh, moved to a lot of different uh, industries and roles uh, uh, from my point of view in a, in a very short career. So uh, I'd like to uh, learn from that. And it's something we saw today with Claudia in that her, um, her career to date has been very diverse, uh, going from law to uh, gaming and advertising and so forth. So. Uh, there might be something there that we can learn from, so it'll be interesting. Uh, next up, we have uh, Neil Matheson. Welcome, Neil. Uh, uh, Neil's uh, chairman of Atlantis Healthcare and CEO of E4 Health Group, um, and uh, that is uh, a company that focuses on uh, product development and marketing for healthcare products. And Neil can talk about that. Uh, and John Stokes. CEO of John Stokes Financial, and John's our financial wizard, and uh, Shane Fleming, VP of uh, Global Commercial Launch Services for Rocket Labs, he's our rocket man. So we've, we've got a good mix here, we've got tech, we've got uh, product marketing, we've got finance, and we've got rockets, so we've got some <laughs> diversity. Uh, so what I'd like you to do. My money. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is uh, hand off to Divya and uh, everyone introduce themselves and give a little bit of background so, so we've got some context to the discussion. Divya. Cool. How many minutes? Just like a minute? Yeah. One minute? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, um, I started off um, actually as a non-profit leader. So I started a um, foundation called P3 Foundation in New Zealand. It was designed to help young people end extreme poverty in Asia Pacific region. So we did things like um, handle the Jandal campaign, which only Kiwis understand what Jandals are, so I wanted to say that here. Um, and after that, um, I, I became a doctor, practiced for a couple of years, and till date, I get a call from Xavier once a year telling me I should go back and do my USMLEs. And every year I think about it, and every year I'm like, too much work. Um, and then after that, I, I went to do an MBA and MPP in the East Coast. Um, the reason really was actually P3 Foundation. I loved what uh, we managed to do there, and I wanted to see how do I get it to a global stage, um, which is why I wanted to understand, um, be here and understand how global companies work. Um, but as I didn't expect, I was expecting to go back home, but I just realized the kind of stuff I was doing in New Zealand, there was a word for it here that back then there wasn't in New Zealand, which was entrepreneurship. I'd been doing like starting small little things, uh, small projects since the age of 16, but I just didn't have a word for it. And here there was a word and I was like, oh, this is what I love doing and I can make a profession out of it, awesome. So that's kind of how I've transitioned. Um, I grew up in a working class family in New Zealand. Um, I was the first one in 
both my parents' families to ever go to university. Uh, as a kid, I had three passions. Um, one was art. I, was, I, I loved drawing, painting. The other was medicine. And the third was sports. And I loved playing rugby as a kid. And uh, it's interesting that those three passions, if you think about it, are the answer to the question I get all the time, which is, how did a phys ed teacher become the CEO of a large multinational company? And the answer is, because I was passionate about the things that I just mentioned, and all of those three things have come together in my career. Um, I work in the medical field, I work in biotechnology and, and pharmaceuticals, and I work in the communications part of that, helping companies bring new products to market, uh, which requires an intense understanding of the science behind the product, but an ability to take that science and communicate it effectively to promote the product. Uh, and that's what I've been doing for the last 35 plus years. Um, very, very interesting. I've been involved with some absolutely amazing revolutionary um, advances in medicine. I, when I first came to the States in 89, I worked with Amgen, a company that only had 100 employees at the time. Now look at it. You know, if you owned a share of Amgen at that point in time, you'd be a multi, multi, multi-millionaire now. But I helped them bring uh, erythropoietin to the market. And erythropoietin was an advance in, in, in oncology care. It allowed patients to get a massively larger amount of chemotherapy than they could tolerate. Um, I've worked on Prilosec, Nexium, you know, major advances in uh, acid reflux disease. I helped launch Clarinex, the, the uh, brother drug or sister drug to Claritin. And I had the great pleasure of working on uh, Viagra, which was uh, a really interesting and, uh, and very, very entertaining time, I might say. And I'll just stop there right now. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Uh, that's where we have to probe on that one. Thanks. John? I have to pass this one over to Shane, you know. <laughs> um, I'm from humble beginnings, very much like uh, what Neil mentioned. Um, finished up high school. I'm from a family of uh, 11, typical Kiwi family. So there was <laughs> 11 of us. Um, it's not till many years later I got married to my wife and she's going through the photos and, and realizing I wasn't wearing shoes, you know. And, uh, and my response to that was we couldn't afford them. So um, those were the good old days. So in any event, um, ended up going to a miserable place called Australia for a period of time, and then uh, found my way coming to uh, to America uh, 30 years ago, just shy of 30 years ago. Um, worked in very uh, different fields, and what I realized very early on, um, like we just heard from uh, Dr. Fraser was, sometimes it's not all about the knowledge you have, it's how big is your heart. And I felt I was that person. So I really over-serviced uh, the people that I did business with essentially and really genuinely cared about them. I think that's a very typical Kiwi trait, just really genuinely cared about these people. And, um, Worked my way into finance. I was working with the uh, Fortune 50 company. I was one of the top producers in the nation and decided that, you know what, they're making the money, not me. Mm -hmm. So um, I've got my whole family here today, my, my, my two wonderful sons and my wife here that, uh, that I've raised in this country. And um, I have this financial firm now that uh, is extremely dear to my heart, not because it's it's reached a very high level of success, but I can mentor people. And I'm at the point in my life that that's extremely important to me. And um, we've heard a lot from a lot of the senior guys and the Olympians here, and I know Chris. We're all about that. So I'd like to speak a little bit more about that today in the, in the business panel. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, John. Shane. Thanks, John. Um, kia ora, everyone. My name's Shane Fleming. It's a pleasure to be here in person this time, and thanks, Xavier, and the Kiwi Leadership Network for putting this on. It's just amazing to be a part of such amazing Kiwis. Um, I was originally uh, raised in Delaware, unfortunately not New Zealand, uh, but yeah, some of us are less fortunate, right? Um, I uh, studied mechanical engineering at CU in Boulder, and uh, post-graduation, I was very fortunate to join a Kiwi U.S. Uh, company startup named Lanzatech. And it was under that uh, 
company that I was able to migrate to New Zealand in 2010. And I've just had the most exciting pleasure to work with such great Kiwis for the last 12 years. Um, first starting with Lanzatech and commercializing uh, carbon capture and reuse technology, uh, really helping solving the global warming problem and, and helping with our energy uh, independence on, on oil, uh, and then also migrating my talents to support the scale up of Rocket Lab and, and Peter Beck's vision. Um, so it's been an incred incredible journey. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but I think we do have a video to show. So um, Rocket Lab, we've had a very incredible journey in getting to orbit, and uh, this video kind of highlights what it looks like to put a launch vehicle into space. That video never gets old. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. So do, do people have to wear those, um, uh, the white coats? Bunny, the bunny suits. Or is that just for the Yeah, that's a video? clean room. So depending on how sensitive the optics are on the satellite, then that dictates the cleanliness requirement. Yep. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. So we thought we had to show the video with this big screen. So, so we did that. Hopefully it, it came across well. Um, so uh, this is a, a, a Q&A panel, so get ready with your questions. So we've got a few out of the can to ask them to get started while you're thinking about yours. Um, uh, so uh, first question, um, it's all about um, Kiwis being successful in the US. Um, uh, and you know, America is a big market, uh, it's hard to break in and establish yourself. Uh, so how important is connections and taking the opportunities when you see them uh, in this market? I, I probably want to start with uh, John on that question. So. It's imperative, quite frankly. Um, having connections is, I think, ultimately where it all starts. I mean, it's great to have a wonderful education and, and uh, come here with that. Um, and, and start with that, uh, obviously that's imperative, but uh, ultimately I think as Kiwis, as I said earlier, we're very genuine people. And um, you saw that in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, no, no chuckles there. Are we rugby players or soccer players here? <laughs> All right, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, quite frankly, I think a lot of my success came definitely from having good connections. And, and, um, but, but not from a standpoint of a selfish motivation. It was very much, for me, it was very much about my ability to want to give. Um, what I see that lacks, and I've been here for 30 years, by the way, and unlike Shane, I am a Kiwi. <laughs> <laughs> um, he knows more about it than I do. So, um, I mean, I can, I can elaborate further, but I think we all understand, right? That's why we're here today, right? We're here to make connections and... Um, meet people for maybe a specific reason, and um, obviously I'm here for that. And um, it's worked out extremely well in my in my in my life. 
I mean, I was able to meet my wonderful wife and uh, have those two beautiful kids over there. So that to me is, you know, definitely what it's about. Thanks, John. Um, you told me a good story about that or how you got started in finance and that with yep. a connection. Yeah, I mean, you know, my story's somewhat unique. I used to be the uh, vice president of uh, a very famous country club. It's Beverly Hills Country Club and um, was able to connect with extraordinary successful people. And that all came from me just caring enough about a certain individual that was the chairman of the country club uh, at that time and is still affiliated with them. And nobody really wanted to give him uh, the time of day. He was uh, a very struggled individual and had an enormous amount of wealth that uh, he felt that his family members, members were going to take advantage of. And I didn't know him from that standpoint. So um, I was able to use that. That Shane and I were on the phone the other night. And I love that word. In fact, I was thinking about it the last couple of days, the Kiwi ingenuity. I was able to use that, I think, in, in, in my favor and the relationship I had with him at that time uh, to really uh, move myself to the next level. Thanks, John. Do you, uh, Neil, do you want to? Yeah. yeah, I think, I think um, in my business, uh, being a Kiwi has been, has been a tremendous asset. And it was mentioned in the previous uh, talk, and I apologize for not being here this morning. I had to drive up from San Diego, but, but um, I'm sure it's been mentioned as well, in that as Kiwis, we have an ability to make people trust us or allow people to trust us because we are straightforward and direct. And sometimes here in America, yeah, it does go the wrong ways. People don't like to hear that. But on the other hand, it's been a great asset to me. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, very early in my time here, I came here in 89, I think it was 1990, I traveled to a place called Bristol, Tennessee. Bristol, Tennessee has an airport called the Tri-Cities Airport, um, which is a fair way out of town. But Bristol, Tennessee is famous for something. Does anyone know what Bristol, Tennessee is famous for? Bristol, Tennessee is famous because if you stand in the middle of the main street, you can put one foot. If you had three feet, you could put a foot in three different states, right? Because Bristol, Tennessee joins up with three different states. That's why it's called the Tri-Cities Airport, I guess, because it's Bristol, Tennessee, Bristol, Kentucky, Bristol, somewhere else. At the time, a little company called Beecham Pharmaceuticals was located in an old schoolhouse in Bristol, Tennessee. And I walked in there on a Monday morning and I met a guy called Kevin Poulos, who was the manager for a drug called Augmentin, which was an antibiotic. And he said to me, Neil, I got a problem and I thought you might be able to help. And so being a little naive Kiwi at the time who had only been here a short period of time, I said, absolutely, I'm going to help you, Kevin. And he told me what the problem was and I said, you've got a bigger problem than that. And I told him what the bigger problem was and we immediately created a relationship. A relationship that was based on me being very forthright with him and him trusting me implicitly. And I'll tell you what, I just got off the phone with Kevin on Friday. He's been with five different companies since then because Beecham got bought by Smith Klein and Smith Klein got bought by GSK and blah, 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 blah. And he's worked in every one of those five companies. He's called me and said, Neil, I have a problem. Can you please come and see me? And the reason he's done that is because he knows I'll cut to the chase, tell him the truth immediately and come up with a solution. And I think that's the power of connections, right? It's, it's creating your connections based on your ability to, to, to show somebody that they can trust you and have confidence in what you're going to tell them and that, that and it will result in, in, in a solution or success. Thanks, Neil. Um, uh, this morning, I mean, I, I started um, uh, as a programmer. I've been in tech all my life and I'm still in tech. So I, I seem pretty boring, I think, compared to Claudia today, for example, who's uh, been in many different industries. Uh, and uh, looking at Divya, um, she started a non-profit. Uh, she got a medical degree. She did medicine. Uh, she started up a tech startup and sold it. Now she's product manager for Google. Uh, can you give us some insights about the benefit of uh, having those range of experiences and how you can bring them together to, to excel? Yeah, um, I, I, I think I should first just clarify, I landed this morning from India, so if I'm not articulate, it's because I haven't slept for the last 24 hours. Um, but, uh, you know, to go back to that question, I think the reason it's 
what drove me to go and experiment and walk into different industries and in different roles was really um, two things. One was I wanted to make sure I'd reach my global maxima because I wasn't sure if I was on the right path. And too often if you're on one path, unless you're one of those lucky people who've known from, the, from like a very young age, this is what I'm supposed to do, and there are people like that, and I am so envious, I wasn't one of them. I, had, I still am figuring out what that path is, and I felt like if I stuck to one, I would never figure out what I am supposed to be doing on this planet on a global global maxima, I don't know if you know about that curve, versus a local maxima. So I personally, because I didn't know, I had to go and experiment and find out for myself. And the second thing that drives me is uh, I really believe the path that's right for you is the one that causes the most spiritual growth, whatever that is. If that's you being an artist that causes the biggest spiritual growth in you, that's what you should be doing. Um, for me, that just happens to be entrepreneurship. I just feel like I have to be a new person at every stage of the company. Every three months, it's like a new person has to be evolving. And to me, there's like nothing more powerful than that. Um, so that's kind of what ended up getting me to this space. And most recently, it became a PM because I was like, you know what, I've done the path of like zero to one, building that kind of company. Um, I've taken, I've done one to 10 with a, another growth stage startup I was part of, but I've never seen like, what does a company look like at 10 to 100? And I wanna see that because one day I wanna build that kind of company and it's good to see it from someone else's perspective. So that's kind of it really. Well, Google's probably a good example of the 10 to 100. Definitely. <laughs> I'll be interested, uh, if you need an investor for your uh, next uh, project, let me know. And <laughs> I'm sure John can help as well. We'll be keen investors. Uh, ju just uh, changing the, um, the angle a little bit, uh, Shane, you're an American that lived in New Zealand, and uh, you're in a, a futuristic field in rockets, uh, and uh, you're with the New Zealand company, which... Growing up, I wouldn't think a New Zealand company would be doing rockets. Um, what's your view on Kiwi innovation and Kiwi entrepreneurship? I'd be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, yeah, so like I said, I've had the pleasure of working with Kiwis for the last 12 years, and the, the greatest thing I love about them is, is actually the people. Um, there's no uh, obstacle too big, too small that cannot be overcome, gone through, around, or you know, just completely destroyed. I think Kiwis always find a way. And I think that's why I like doing business with them. Um, I love rolling my sleeves up and getting things done. And as Morris mentioned, there's very little red tape and it's just the kind of Kiwi attitude. Come on, let's get on with it and let's go. And um, when you're a startup, you know, you have very little resources, you have very little capital. Um, and the only thing you have is people and elbow grease. And so um, I think just working with Kiwis, tackling really world challenging problems is is just a pleasure to be a part of that atmosphere and like we were having a conversation on the phone the other night just the kiwi ingenuity is is second to none um when you look at kiwis globally um i think they do find really innovative solutions to problems and i think part of that is because they are this geographic gem in the south pacific you know uh, inevitably they've had challenges getting resources uh, to the country or you know you can't buy big expensive equipment uh, in certain areas and if it breaks down you can't really ship it back so you got to fix it on your own and so they end up really do uh, understanding how that machinery works or that process works and not only do they fix it they make it better and so uh, just being a part of that ecosystem has been great and i think kiwis have a lot of uh, a huge track record of, of innovation you know they've always punched above their weight and um yeah that's why i yeah go back to working with Kiwis all the time. But not to say that other nationalities aren't great too, but Kiwis definitely punch above their weight. Well, as an American, we welcome you to the Kiwi Leadership Network right, as well. Thank you. <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, Neil, uh, you could probably add to that. I, I the, just, uh, yeah. no, I just, wanna, I just wanna add something, not a negative, but just a, but a but to that, right? <laughs> and, and, and the but is that w we as Kiwis tend to be quite comfortable when we reach a certain level. We, you know, it doesn't take a lot to make us happy and comfortable. And so when it comes to understanding the scope and scale of the opportunity, 
we're sometimes quite happy doing 10% of what's really the full potential. And it's not because we don't want to strive for the 100%, it's because we reach 10% and we're real comfy. You know, we're sitting there with a beer in our hand watching the ball game on a Sunday. But, you know, it, it, w there is a tendency for us to not understand or not appreciate the full potential of what the United States market, for example, has to offer. And when I talk to New Zealand trade and industry um, groups that come through the New Zealand Embassy in DC, and, and I see these amazing inventors from New Zealand, you know, these people that, that w have woven sensors into wool and knitted a garment that a soldier can wear so that we can have real time monitoring of the body functions of that soldier. And I said, how many of those do you think you could make? They said, well, we've made 10. I said, do you know there are 500,000 soldiers in the, in the army in the United States who would need one of them? The scale of getting from 10 to 500,000 was something they hadn't quite thought about, right? So I think, I think that's something that you learn from being immersed in the US market is the scale is enormous and you have to think outside of our normal New Zealand scale, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. if I can alliterate on that. I'm thinking outside the box, that's big, big time here. You just can't be. You just can't go the, the status quo here. Essentially, that that's definitely what um, I've learned in my life. And and furthermore, it's just not a Kiwi thing. This is this is a, a human thing. There's a lot. There's a lot of folks here in America that could be, you know, running this country. We wish, and um, just just haven't got that final. Rod Dixon's right there. He can speak to that that final last leg in that marathon that made him a folk hero, essentially, right? So, yeah, that's a human thing. And uh, I probably say that, especially in the industry I'm in, where you've got a lot of folks out there that um, in the finance business that, that think they can get rich overnight. Mm -hmm. It, it, it does, doesn't exist. And you, list, you got that lottery ticket, or I think you said you got a little bit of luck on your side. Thanks, John. Um, uh, so with the Kiwi, Kiwi attitude, the can-do attitude, um, um, generalist, um, uh, relatively unbureaucratic way we approach things, um, how, do we, how do we adapt that for success in the US? Do you want to take the lead on that one, Neil? Yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> the first thing I want to say is you've got to be true to yourself and you've got to understand what you bring to the table as a Kiwi, right? If you, if you know instinctively how we think and how we do things and you stay with that and don't try to become American, you'll be very successful. And I'll tell you that why that is. The first thing is we have an accent. When you have an accent, people listen more. And Americans aren't good listeners. They tend to start talking before you've finished. But when you've got an accent, they listen. That's the first thing. Even though they don't understand sometimes what you're saying, so you have to explain yourself. Don't ever say you got a trolley at the supermarket because that is something that really makes them <laughs> very strange. Uh, um, so the first thing is understand what we bring to the table. Understand the way we think is a little different. Understand the way we get up and go and get things done is different. But someone said it before, make sure you also understand how to fit that into the corporate culture in America. Corporate culture in America is built around a, a, a military model. And the military model is you do what you're told. You wait for the work to come to your desk, you process it, you send it on. New Zealanders don't think like that. If there's a job to be done, we do it. We don't wait. You know, if there's something to be done, we go and get it, right? Not, not so much in American business. Also, the cover your ass syndrome in America is because if you do something wrong, you get smacked. Now, it, my son grew up here playing American football, and I used to sit on the sideline and watch the way the coaches treat the players when they make a mistake. They get scolded. They get, they get reamed out. Rugby in New Zealand was never like that. We never, ever scold anyone for making a mistake, right? What do we say? Don't make that mistake again. Come on, get over it, right? And so business is a bit like that too. People cover their ass because they're worried the boss is going to ream them out if they make a mistake. New Zealanders don't work like that. You know, part of my success has been building companies where the New Zealand culture has enabled Americans to be free and to, and to really excel and to really feel. And it took them a while to trust that they could do that. But I think if you do those sorts of things, you're very successful here. And one last thing. 
And I tell this to, to all the companies from New Zealand that come up and visit. I said, someone gave me some very good advice. They said, the first thing you do, Neil, when you start a company in America is you go and find a good lawyer, preferably Jewish, good lawyer. <laughs> preferably from New York, a good lawyer. And the second thing you do is you find a really good accountant and you make sure that whenever you do anything in business, you run it by your lawyer. And it is true. It's a very litigious society. It's a highly regulated country. And in my business, which is really re highly regulated, uh, I had the uh, interesting experience of being caught up in my clients' court cases with the attorney generals of three different states. And I got called as a witness because of the work I did on behalf of those companies. And I tell you, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to respond to an attorney general's uh, request for information. So just a few of the things that I've learned over the years, but I think that the, the hard thing for us is, you know, don't change what we know is good and adapt to what we also know is good here and make it work both ways, right? That's good, Neil. I'm going to write that one down. Got that? Anyone want to add to that before we open it up? Um, so, questions. Who's got some questions? Where's the football or the cube? Here it is. Okay. If I can start. Um, thank you, guys, for sharing your experiences. Um, I'm curious, how do you, as kind of leaders for these various businesses of different sizes and uh, working with different products, what, what have you found is the most successful way of inspiring your team to come along with you and to help kind of follow your vision or your leadership so that they're a part of it and that they're joining in this journey? Oh, I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> um, pe people respond to people who they trust and believe in, right? And if you give people a reason to believe, they're going to follow and they're going to be motivated. And I told you, I removed a lot of sort of the traditional American style, right? When um, Michael Campbell beat Tiger Woods and the US Open uh, down in um, uh, wherever it was in North Carolina, um, on the Monday, I had my creative people create a black card with a silver fern on it and I put a $100 note inside and I gave it to all 240 people in my company and I said, this is to celebrate Michael Campbell beating Tiger Woods in the US Open, right? That one thing, I got more response from that one thing than anything else I ever did. People was just so inspired by that, right? And, and I think it's about giving people something to, to believe in and to enter and, and to be to, to make to make them feel like they know you in a lot of American companies the workers never see the CEO they don't know who the CEO is you know in a lot of my clients the big companies like Pfizer in New York the CEO is on the 54th floor and he has his own elevator he, do, he doesn't mix with the people you know and I, so I think this you know taking away the structure a little bit creating teams just like we used to do on the rugby field you know I you know those skills go a long way here in leadership? Um, I, I would say there's, um, in product, uh, whether you're doing it for your own company or at a company like Google, um, I found empathy is probably one of the strongest uh, motivators. So with our engineers and designers, I always try to make sure that they are getting to know the user as much as possible as I am. You, getting to know the user is like number one priority for a product manager, but if you can get your designers and engineers to also get to know the user as well as you do, or, or um, almost as well, they're gonna start to see the same stories that you're hearing and be way more compelled to solve those problems. So in the case of the health tech company, that I that we that I built um, with my co-founder, we would have doctors and nurses come in like on a like weekly basis and just chat about their day to day and the challenges that they were having. So we knew what we were solving for. And now with Google Maps, like a bunch of us flew to India and then Colombia, Bogota, so we could be on the ground and see how users are using Google Maps. And that's not just PMs; like a bunch of people from cross disciplines uh, came along, and then. You know, we're going to do a kickoff meeting where we're going to go, okay, these are the problems we saw. These are the user stories that we came across with. How do we solve this problem? That's way more motivating than me being like, this is what I think we should do. So I felt like empathy is one of the strongest things. Good. Good. 
Joel? Yeah, I'll say a few okay. words. Um, so for me, anyway, with startups, I guess surrounding yourself with the best people is really important, and finding those people uh, is is not always easy. Recruitment um, has always been a challenge for at least the startups I've worked for, and so uh, finding those people, recruiting within your networks, and kind of growing organically. Uh, when you raise a whole lot of seed money in Series A, it's quite easy to just you know put the fo- throttle down, start hiring people, and, and going. But um, I think hiring the right people is, is just as important as, you know, potentially not hiring uh, someone who could potentially be bad in the organization at an early stage. Um, so surrounding yourself with the best people, with the right ideas, and the right motivation is really important. And then motivating and empowering those people. So removing any roadblocks and really empowering them to do their job and take away things that, you know, could be slow them down like simple things like just when you're in an R&D phase ordering things or having uh, facilities available you know whether it's just even food or basic things to do their job is really important and then beyond that as I mentioned kind of really empowering them to do their job Um, so motivation uh, is key Um, we talked about you know having the CEO close you know Peter Beck and Sean Simpson two founders that that I followed very closely were always a part of the staff we lived in uh, bullpen offices at Balfour Road at Level Two in Parnell, um, and being amongst that that environment uh, with such motivated people, I think you know just encourage you to to work even harder and longer. And um, and, and being a part of that that environment is great. But I always always uh, you know I love. Uh, getting people excited about what we do, um, not only internally but externally. You know, with with Rocket Lab, I was in charge of uh, leading the charge down in Mahia and in Christchurch to be able to support a project of national significance, which was the Launch Range, uh, Launch Complex One in Mahia, and uh, trying to convince communities that it's a good idea to build a launch range uh, in their backyard when they have you know environmental concerns, security concerns, things like that is, is a really difficult thing to do, and. So so getting them to you know uh, listen to them, them listening to you, and empowering them to help shape a project like that and an industry is just is I think getting people bought into what you're doing it has a huge huge amount of um, advantages to that. Shane, John, were you going to add something there? Or? Boy, these are one. I'm taking mental notes going, wow, I've got to apply. I'm going to office Monday morning, and that's what I'm applying. That's great stuff. Just, uh, no, I humbly say uh, being up here is, is a humble experience and hanging out with some obviously very successful people. Appreciate it. Um, it all goes back to the story, I think. Um, my story is, and my background is very compelling for my employees. Um, all of them have higher educations than me, but when, they, when you walk into that room, I believe I'm the most caring. And that story has really resonated at my firm. Um, it's grown leaps and bounds over the last uh, three, four years. And um, the way things are going, it's apparently heading in that direction. But that's not at all a reflection of my personal stories. I'm able to t- take that story as the visionary of the company now and, and lead with that. And, you know, because in this day and age, we all know. Um, and I've spoken to a few of you. It's, it's, um, if you don't have that, you're going to your next job, right? You're going to quit and go to your next job. And my firm is based on, we deal with a lot of executives that are transitioning, be as it uh, they're being axed in the corporate boardroom and um, you know, all, for, all for different levels. And, you know, empathy is obviously when I hire people at my company, ironically, it's one of the words that has to be said from the, uh, the person we're hiring, that they have enough empathy in their life. Of course, education, that uh, when Does they that come to Does that mean I can company, get hired? <laughs> you're hired. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's. Yeah, I, I know um, uh, for my business, it took a while to get started, and I've been uh, telling the story on that. But uh, through my career, I've sort of stayed in contact with people I think are best in their fields. Uh, and when we finally got some momentum, I got them on board. So now I feel confident I've got the A team with me that can build the the next level of management to to take the company forward as well. So I think it's important to to keep in contact with those key people that you think can make a difference in you in, in what you're doing going forward, uh, and bring them on uh, on on the journey as well. Uh, and then that shared passion just continues to multiply and 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 build out. So. 
Are we got any? I think we've got time for one more question, right? <laughs> I love this box. How awesome yep, is that? That's good. Cheap hey guys, um, thanks for being here today and sharing your knowledge. Um, I wanted to know what do you think are some of the common mistakes or failures that New Zealand companies make when they're looking to either launch or scale here in the States? You know, uh, the other problem we have is we're so often um, good at just getting on with things and we're sometimes pretty stubborn about the fact that we know what we're doing that we fail to understand this great American concept of consulting. And I've found that, you know, it took me a while to realize that actually there are really good experts out there and they, you don't have to pay them a lot, you know. Consulting, you know, is good good business to be in because you get paid quite well. But you've got to get the right expertise and the right information and the right advice at the right times because we're not sitting in New Zealand building a little thing. We're sitting in America building a great big thing. And it takes a lot more than just one person. Um, the talent thing, obviously, that everyone's mentioned is critical. But but having really good advisors is really important, um, as Mr. Trump knows. Um, so, uh, but but it's true, right? I mean, it's really, really true. Um, is it? You, 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 have to, you have to understand when you when you don't understand something enough that you need to go out and get the right advice. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah on that, um, uh, when I first came to the US, I'd start up at Orion Health up here. And, and it was a software company to healthcare. We got the revenues about over 100 million uh, a year uh, through, that, through that process. Uh, and uh, that can do Kiwi attitude. You've got to blend it with getting the right advisors. A good example of that is that we were successful selling into about 35 hospitals in about 35 states. And then someone said, what about the sales tax? So we had sold into 35 states without even thinking about the sales tax. So we had to do voluntary disclosures to the IRS across every freaking state and so forth. So uh, uh, you don't know what you don't know. So it's important to get some local people on the ground that do know uh, and blend them with the, with the Kiwi team that uh, is launching. And the two together can be powerful. Um, but that was... Uh, I remember signing a lot of paperwork for that. So, <laughs> uh, how are we doing on time? We, one more, one more question. Anyone want the um, the cube? If there are no more questions, Paul, can I just say one last thing? Sure, Neil. Um, you know, I I've been the uh, president of the Alumni Association of the University of Otago here in the States. Just recently finished my, my term this last Saturday with a very big celebration at the New Zealand Embassy in Washington, D.C., uh, the 150th anniversary of Otago University. And one of the things that we did at the embassy was we had displays of some of the amazing Kiwis that have graduated from the University of Otago and done great things across America. Uh, and one of those people I met only recently, Xavier, and this is a young man that, um, and I'm going to get a bit emotional, but he's impressed me like no one, no one I've met recently. And uh, I asked him, and I knew he was so busy, but I asked him if he'd come on the board of, of the alumni of the University of Otago in America. And he said yes, and I knew that he, he wanted to be on the board, and I knew he had so many obligations. And I was very, very sad uh, when he called me recently to say he has to go back to New Zealand to take care of his mum and, and wish you well with that, Xavier. But um, he, he'll stay always as an Otago alumni and now that he's going to be down New Zealand, we'll have someone down there we can tap into. But I just wanted to acknowledge, not because he's from Otago University, but because, he's, because he is a great Kiwi and, and the work he's put into this and assembling the group that, that, that does this is amazing. And Xavier, thank you. And I just want to wish you the very best. Yeah, thank you, Xavier. And uh, thanks to the panel. Uh, appreciate your, uh, your input. Thanks. Good.